Well, hello and glorious gr greetings to everyone today. Thank you so much for being here for another webinar with us here at the DNA Company. Uh, my name is Dr. Lara Varden. I am the Dean of the DNA University and an in-house clinician here at the DNA Company. And I have the wonderful honor and pleasure uh, to be hosting tonight with our own Dr. Bryce Wild, one of our co-founders and just esteemed colleagues, brilliant, uh, such an honor. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about how to boost your immunity using some genetic insights. We're going to talk about some supplementation. We're going to be talking about nutrition and how that works with immune health, uh, talking about gut health and immune health, and really diving in uh, to how all of that works. So I want to say thank you again. And Dr. Bryce, thank you for being here. Hey, it's so I love doing these with you. Uh, it's always fun. Um, we love uh, the material, of course. We are uh, huge ambassadors of uh, genomic screening, but more than that, spreading the information and the love and making sure everyone is well armed going into, uh, in this case, cold and flu season, right? So, um, by the way, you know where a sneeze goes, right? Why don't you? Tell us, where does a sneeze go? At you. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrible. I don't even know where that came from. You know, I, I do a lot of television and on one of these national shows that I do, I'm known for like the dad uh, jokes, the bad dad jokes. So I kind of always break the ice, come out of the gate and tell one. So that was just like a natural re <laughs> knee jerk reaction. <laughs> but, but of course, you know, we all know important uh, how important the immune system is. And that's what uh, the nature and the topic of conversation is. And I think what we decided to do off camera here is that, you know, get the question, you know, going around in people's minds as to, you know, if they've ever even wondered how the immune system works, obviously we'll cover that, but why some people seem to kind of shrug off a, a flu bug while others get knocked out by the exact same virus, right? I mean, it turns out the answer isn't just about exposure. You know, we all get exposed, but it's about what's happening inside your body, largely controlled by your immune system, whether it's activated, depressed, uh, whether external factors are at play, obviously. Uh, genes have a lot to say about that as your predisposition goes, but certainly what you do with your diet, nutrition, lifestyle, how much you sleep, how stressed you are, what toxins you're exposed to. So it's a delicate balance, right? Um, and of course, if I didn't say it, but how nourished you are, um, so as you said, you know, we're diving deep into personalized immunity and how understanding, um, I suppose the genetic makeup can unlock these secrets to what would we say stronger, more resilient immune system. Cause that's what I'm seeing in clinical practice. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a, uh, an immune system dysregulation. That's, what's been trending in my 24, almost 25 years of clinical practice, um, it, it, lack of immune resilience. You know, some people are just way over the top immune, uh, you know, hyperactive and others are immune depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess we'll talk about that and explore how DNA impacts everything from your body's ability to fight infections uh, and how it handles oxidative stress and so forth, but also how ingredients like vitamin C and zinc, glutathione and all these things can act as tools to empower uh, the immune system and uh, put, you know, get it more in your favor, right? Oh, absolutely. Not just that but just the fact of things like small things like stress, how that can really affect the body. Um, there's, we really need to take it in a holistic aspect and realize that there are many different factors that affect the immune system, uh, the gut and the immune system. And actually, I just for a moment would like to zoom out, take like a 30,000 foot view of you know, people getting sick and, you know, what the theories are. I mean, when you consider actually, uh, you know, in school, you know, learning about germs and, you know, microbiology and, and medical microbiology and everything else, there are two main theories. You have the germ theory and the terrain theory. And these really are two very different perspectives on the cause of disease and how it interacts uh, how the body interacts with microbes and pathogens. So just a brief little primer for people uh, to kind of understand that the germ theory. Now, this was developed in the 19th century by scientists like Louis Pasteur. 
Now I'm sure people will hear, oh, pasture, that sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, because he created the system of pasteurization um, along with uh, Robert Koch, a uh, Koch, K-O-C-H. Um, and that really has been the dominant framework in modern medicine because it basically covers how microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites are the primary cause of disease. So, you know, basically it's saying, okay, you get this infection, you, you get this exposure, and that is what leads the body to the infection, the illness, that disease can be transmitted from person to person through contact sneezes. Uh, too, and contaminated food, you know, vectors like mosquitoes, things like that. And generally, it is treated um, with medications, along with, you know, various other things. So with the terrain theory, this was actually uh, thought up more with uh, by Dr. An uh, Antoine Beauchamp. And your French, you can speak French. If I mispronounce that, I, I apologize. Uh, but he was a contemporary of Pasteur and he offered a different view. And he really looked at the internal environment. The terrain of the body really determines whether someone gets sick. And things that understanding that microbes are everywhere. We are always exposed, but it really is because of the body's terrain, whether it's weakened and imbalanced um, with poor nutrition, stress, toxins, lifestyle, um, that actually will make them sick. That the body's health and resilience is not necessarily the presence of the germs that are the most important factor as compared to someone's ability uh, to respond and heal that strength of and integrity of the terrain. So as you were saying, oh, some people get sick and, you know, maybe, you know, a friend or whatever, they're exposed to the same thing, but yeah, they may get a little, little cough, a little fever, but get over it within a day or two. And the other person's out for a week or two. We look at it more as the terrain, but also looking at your genetic profile. What is it that you have to work with? Because that gives us the blueprint to be able to manipulate, to strengthen where you're weak genetically or lean in on the strengths that you have genetically. So we can actually look at it, not just, you know, throw up in the air and go, okay, well, how do I make it stronger? This is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Absolutely. That search for the uh, single pathogen or some single external agent uh, as cause of infection is uh, outdated, uh, archaic. Um, it's driven a lot of what modern medical science can still focuses on, you know, what is the virus? What is the bacteria in question? But <clears throat> finding that single pathogens, not the whole solution to treating or preventing disease. And the best plan is really to effectively arm your immune system informed by your genomics, informed by your gut microbiota, uh, informed by how fast you may be uh, aging. <clears throat> and, you know, you know, I explain this to my patients all the time. When the epitome of health is not whether you get sick, it's the speed at which you recover. And frankly, some of the intensity of symptoms on onset, like how quickly you spike a fever or how, you know, fast you might be to start, you know, sweating during that fever, all of these sort of acute onsets, you know, rapid and intense, so long as they don't get out of control, are actually very healthy, um, fast and furious. <clears throat> what concerns me also, by the way, is when people say they never get sick. In fact, I see that largely in my population of autoimmune patients, people that have immune systems from which have been com confused. They've become confused. They start attacking their own body tissue. That's because their immune systems are always on alert. They're always firing up uh, what's called you know, a cytokine uh, proliferation or immune uh, inflammatory cells. And uh, because they're always on alert, they may have a viral or bacterial experience that enters their body, but they quickly put it to rest. And that might sound good, but it's not because they're attacking their own tissue. So, you know, when you see a doctor for an annual checkup and they take a blood test, um, they're looking for, you know, red blood cell counts. Uh, they're looking for, you know, the distribution and size. They're looking at white blood cells, you know, what's high or low representative of certain infections, maybe. Um, and, and, and this is important uh, because it reveals sort of how many troops you have in your immune system army. 
But what I'd like to focus on maybe out of the gate in this sort of analogy by definition of military or, or army, um, the number of troops won't give you the full picture of what your immune system is up to. So it alone can't define your immune threshold, your ability to act under certain situations. And it certainly doesn't necessarily give insights as to genetically how well you do with <clears throat> toxins, how well you might do with stress. And, and there's no such thing as good or bad. Genes are just what they are. And knowing your Achilles heels are important to be able to address them and certainly in advance. But if half of your immune army is sleeping, for example, or hung over from a night of partying, um, you know, or you don't have optimal genetics that direct them what to do. So, you, you know, this is your immune activity. There's a group called natural killer cells, natural killer cell activity. This is the equivalent of special forces or Navy SEALs. This is your innate immunity. You're born with it. If, if they're not on guard or well-trained, uh, you're letting stuff through, right? And by analogy, um, this is equivalent to, again, like, this this the seek and destroy always on alert you you could have an ideal number of regular troops who are awake and alert and active but but also how they're armed plays a role so if they only have access to sticks and stones not a really great army you know you can't offend yourself so well but if you're armed with you know what we call uh, effective cytotoxicity an immune system that's armed with the state of uh, you know the art weaponry um that's better and your genes can tell uh, you know, us a lot about that or how predisposed your army, you know, might be to succumbing to your environment or whether your issue is really circadian rhythm, poor sleep, or is it stress, you know, that's causing uh, you not to be able to deal effectively with, uh, you know, uh, in, immune related uh, issues. Uh, and by the way, we've got a poll going on. Uh, so don't forget to fill that out and we'll get back to uh, sort of what we're finding there. Um, questions around, you uh, you know, whether you're familiar with your connection uh, between your genetic makeup or not, uh, how you're, if you're currently taking any supplements, we want to hear from you. We're going to answer your questions toward the end, by the way, uh, top of the next hour. If you're dealing with, you know, uh, autoimmune issues, long COVID, frequent colds and flu. So please fill out the, uh, the poll and, uh, and then we'll, um, we'll get into some of those findings because it'll help us guide uh, the conversation tonight. Um, th you know, I, I know off camera, we also talked about how this is how you learned uh, initially early days by analogy, uh, Dr. Varden, you know, your sort of uh, understanding of the immune system by, uh, by analogy of the army. And it still sticks. It's one of those things I think translates to most people. Absolutely. I mean, when you consider that, you know, 70 to 80% of your immune system is from your gut, your gut population the uh, the amount that you have, the diversity really is important. And your good guys, your beneficial bacterium, fungi versus pathogenic, the bad guys, you know, who's going to be stronger? Who do you feed? Who are you feeding? That's going to make a, a huge difference. Also, toxins that you can be exposed to can affect the population. So, you know, again, you've got these warring factions and, you know, within uh, a particular army, you've got specialties. You know, you've got snipers. You have those, you know, ones that go out in the dark of night and kind of scout out quietly. And then you have that come back and tell the information to the others and get them ready, tell them, you know, who the bad guys look like, what's going on. Well, those uh, scouts, um, those snipers, those are more of your innate immune system. They are the ones, you know, who go looking around. When you come back, when they come back and inform what the information to the rest of the troops, that's more of the adaptive immune system. They know what they're going to be fighting. They'll recognize it when they see it. Also, you know, when they've been fighting, they're ready for it. So uh, is there anything more you wanted to uh, add to that before we start jumping into looking at some of the nutrigenomics, some of um, you know, the genes that directly affect immune system. I would ask just a little bit more about the innate versus learned, because I think it's really important for folks to understand they're born with an immune system. And um, a little bit later on, we'll talk about these genes, obviously, as you just alluded to, uh, that'll be next. But 
you know, some of us are born with uh, the genetic code to be more optimal at detoxification. Uh, some of us uh, better at methylation or some of us better at, you know, regulating some letter vitamins like D, A, E. Um, and, but whether you are what we would call optimal or suboptimal, <clears throat> we're all born with an immune system. There are ways in which to empower or make it better. But this idea of innate versus learned, um, many things influence how strong that uh, learned system is. Uh, so this innate immunity, and it, by the way, the innate immunity is so you know, reliant on how we come into this world, you know, the microbiome you described, which is again, 70, 80% of our immune system through this GALT or the acronym GALT or, or gut associated lymphoid tissue where a lot of the T regulatory cells sit. So how we're born that is naturally vaginally birthed and or breastfed is going to dictate uh, a lot of how the innate immune system works. But if we imagine sort of uh, beyond the sort of, beyond the sort of um, type of army we have or the variations of troops or how many of these Navy SEALs or special forces we have, we can also imagine on top of that, you know, sort of our immune system is like a castle um, with this army and these guards. And some people's castles are super strong, right? They can keep the bad guys out uh, like flu bugs or, or bacteria. Um, and they do it quite easily and efficiently and others, you know, might just naturally and inherently let a few bad guys in. So, but the thing is this, and that's the innate aspect and in how we're born in the genes, but if guards are well-rested and if they're well-equipped and if they have good generals, uh, they can fight off invaders. You know, we can all develop good immune systems, but if they're tired, again, if they don't have the right weapons, they'll struggle. Um, so this is where we start testing. We can check you sort of, you know, how many guards do you have? Um, you know, we can be looking at genes, our blood, our microbiome, uh, but that still doesn't tell the whole story. It's, it's like counting how many soldiers in an army, but not knowing if they've got those swords, sticks, or machine guns, right? So just driving that home, part of why we're going to dig deep into this is the genes that dictate um, how uh, your learned system will behave how quickly and adaptive are you resilience because that's what seems to be going down in this day and age is our society is developing immune dysregulation and lack of immune resilience not just how we fight bugs uh, but then how we snap back into balance and not get into autoimmunity or prolonged like long covid states of chronic dysregulated pro-inflammatory uh, states and autoimmunity, by the way, is year over year on a rise. It's inc it's incredible to summarize the literature, about 8% year over year. It's astonishing how dysregulated uh, we have become. So uh, just I would extend on that. So yeah, we have so many you know genes that we can uh, get into. Where do you want to start? Well, I want to start with the poll. So if Good we idea. can pick that up, we'll take a look and see how our audience is answering. So our first question, how familiar are you with the connection between your genetic makeup and your immune system's function? And uh, we have this beautiful bell curve uh, with about a little over 10% saying that they're very familiar. Um, most of you saying somewhat fam familiar. And, you know, I have noticed through our polls that we do have some very informed uh, audience members, uh, you know, really doing their homework and, you know, really empowering themselves with the education. Uh, we've got about 30% that say, I've heard of it, but don't know much. And uh, just under 10% that say not familiar at all. Well, this is for you. So uh, you should be able to at least learn a few pearls of wisdom and some uh, information here in this webinar. Next question, number no, two. Are you currently taking any supplements specifically to support your immune system? Uh, now this one, yeah, we have over 60% that says yes, regularly. Around 30% are saying occasionally, 3% uh, saying no, and 8% saying no, don't take any supplements. So maybe this will give you some insight um, into supplementation, into what's helpful, but I do want to to mention here that the information we are going to be talking about, the supplements we are going to be mentioning is for educational purposes only. We highly encourage you to speak with your healthcare practitioner, uh, your doctor, especially if you're taking any medications, 
uh, to make sure that anything that you start is appropriate for you. So um, again, this is just for educational information only. Number three, are you dealing with any of the following? And we asked you to choose one. Uh, we've got- Look at that, autoimmune disorders. Uh, I told yeah. you, you know, 42%, so, they're dealing with it. Exactly, that's our, our biggest one. We've got uh, around 8% with long COVID, 5% frequent colds and flu, 16% um, with immune dysregulation, and about 30% other immune issues. So, you know, if you want to pop that in the chat, we can uh, take a look and see um, what kinds of other immune issues that you are dealing with. But yeah, you nailed it, um, the, the autoimmune. Number four, yep. what do you think most impacts your immune health? Um, and this, you know, obviously multiple choice. Um, and yeah, I do like that. Absolutely. Sleep. We've got 70... You know, I I think intuitively uh, our, 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 our attendees have gotten it exactly right. You know, I, I think they've got it bang on in terms of hierarchy there. We kind of mixed yes. it all up, but you know, sleep number one, stress, uh, or actually nutrition number two, it's very close. They're all very close stress. Number three environment, and then supplementation. I'm actually happy. Everyone has said supplementation is last because it's an integral factor. It's a tool. Um, and on that note, can I just say, I just got to say, I am going to now and take questions about it, debunk what naysayers talk about all the time, which is you can't boost your immune system. You absolutely can boost, activate, empower, substantiate, you know, your immune system, regulate, modulate, but boosting really specifically occurs in that innate immunity where those natural killer cells, their activity, non-selective uh, can be boosted and your immune system can be balanced. So I will come back to that as often as people want to hear about it, but I just, it drives me bonkers and I'll argue with anyone who, uh, who wants to talk about the mechanism of action around that, but absolutely all in any of these things can help to empower and boost frontline immune defense. Beautifully stated. And yes, something that needs to be restated <laughs> many times. So our last question, have you had any testing done that would offer insights on your immune system function? And beautiful to see that uh, quite a few of you, almost 70% have done our, our DNA 360 test. Um, a little over 30% have done our, uh, or have done a gut microbiome test, which by the way, yes, we do offer one, our gut 360. Uh, we've got about 24% that have done autoimmunity testing. Um, we've got 5% that have done infectious disease testing and then 24% with other. Uh, so again, if you want to pop that in the chat, we can take a look to see, you know, what kinds of other testing that you have done. And I want to say thank you for filling out the poll. We really appreciate this. So we know what you want to know. Absolutely. And maybe for a moment before we get into the, uh, in, you know, the, uh, the line item genetics, right. And what we can you know, do to define how they're working, uh, directly or indirectly with our immune system. Um, if you don't mind, I think I, I would just love to, you know, accentuate the idea around how your immune system is empowered uh, as much by what you take away. Uh, that is to say stress and toxins as it is by what you put into yourself. So kind of a little bit of an extension on this, what might be causing immune dysregulation through sleep, dietary, you know, stress, um, all these different things. And, and I, I refer to this as uh, the three R's of if anyone were to sort of take anything away and think, how do I manage my immune system best informed by genomics, informed by microbiome for sure. But, it, but I have these three R's. One is it's, it's remove, replenish, and regenerate. Uh, so the first of the three R's, this remove, it reminds us that before we add anything into our body to support the immune system, boost it, supplements, et cetera, most important challenge is to remove obvious obstacles um, to health, to cure, right? Uh, obstacles to cure, roadblocks, uh, known hidden toxins, molds in our environment uh, that impede the body's natural defenses. 
uh, and we'll talk about it. And I know you want some, you, you know, dying to talk about, you know, uh, glutathione and how, you know, we got to debunk some stuff around glutathionization genes, but glutathione is one of the most abundant, important intracellular antioxidants that works for us. We make it on our own. If we've got issues, we can boost it. Um, but to help to detoxify some of these toxins. But again, the first thing is to remove them. Replenish, this is, you know, when you've removed these obstacles uh, to health and cure and lowered the overall burden or threshold, I like to call it, uh, the next step is to replenish ingredients that support a healthy immune system. And by ingredients, I don't now mean supplements that boost the immune system. I mean deficiencies, both informed by genetics, let's say vitamin D. If you're low and you live north of 40 degrees where I do, uh, you're just not getting enough sun. So you have to replenish, you have to substitute, supplement. So from vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, pre and postbiotics, natural ingredients to replenish. And then of course, regenerate, that's key. So research around intermittent fasting, autophagy, right? Get, get the old and dead cells, dying cells, uh, you know, senescent cells out and the new ones in. And if anything, this is where the literature is really heavy, right? You would agree with me, Dr. Varden, around intermittent fasting, in the short order, even one or two day water fasts, the number one thing we're seeing is an improvement in immune system function, right? Natural killer cell upregulation. This is why I think it's a little loosey goosey to say fast for a week, reduce chances, all, all cause uh, cancer by 50 or 60%, whatever biohackers are promoting these days. But I think there's good science there to support that in part. So even with the first couple of R's in place, you know, our bodies are counting on this process of degeneration, regeneration. So for plen this replenishment, this regeneration is a general system overhaul, restoration of these crucial biological um, cells, materials, et cetera, then, uh, you know, this is referring to maintenance routine, regeneration, right? And uh, what we can do through life, uh, lifestyle diet and um, in order to repair the chronic and constant insults. Uh, to the immune system. So those are the three R's. I thought I'd throw that out there. And um, without further ado, let's just get into the genetics of it all. Absolutely. And uh, when we were talking about toxins, okay, our body naturally makes waste products, um, you know, just through regular metabolism. Our body has to take out that trash. And that's one of the main reasons why we have the detoxification pathways. Also, toxins that we are exposed to just even in the natural environment, um, like what Dr. Bryce was talking about. Yes, we want to limit, mitigate the exposures as best we can, but we're never going to totally get rid of all of it unless you live in some sort of bubble and everything else. And that's just not practical. So mitigating toxic exposures, yes, but the support is really necessary and it is supporting your detoxification pathway. So in our anti-inflammation uh, reports, anti-inflammatory reports, you will find the list of your detoxification pathways. And this includes your glutathione conjugation pathway, your antioxidation pathway, your methylation pathway, your vitamin D pathway. These are all very important when it comes to health detoxification. Also vitamin D, which is a hormone, is extremely important in the body because it works on and is a necessary ingredient for over 10% of all, all of our protein coding genes. There's over 22,000 protein coding genes. So you're looking at over 2,200 genes need vitamin D, hormone D to, to work well. And vitamin D also plays a very impactful role on the gut, on gut health. And remember what we said, 70 to 80% of your immune system is from your gut. So we want to support the gut. So the genes that uh, and pathways that you want to refer to and look at <clears throat> are, well, of course, vitamin D pathway, um, methylation pathway, antioxidation, glutathione conjugation. So glutathione, glutathione is the master antioxidant of the body. This is created in the liver and it is very important. We actually look at three particular genes 
your GST T1, T is in Tom, GST M1, M is in Mary, and GST P1, P is in Paul. Now, the GST T1 and GST M1 are actually copy numbers. We look at copy number variants. So uh, we will report whether you have no copies, which is a null variant, if you have one copy or two copies. For your GST P1, that's actually in a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. So you will see letters, you know, like an A, a G, an AA, GG, you know, one of those. Um, the A's are optimal, G's are suboptimal. So, you know, that can kind of give you an idea on how, how well it works. So I have a question or a belief that clients will often come to me when they have say zero copies of one of the you know, either GSTT1, GSTM1 or zero copies of both. And they say, oh, do I don't make any glutathione or I don't detox. And Dr. Wild, how, how do you, if you get those kinds of questions, how would you unpack and explain the truth um, to debunk that belief uh, when it comes to glutathione and that person's detoxification ability with glutathione? Yeah. So as I mentioned at the top, uh, no such thing as bad genes, good genes. Um, I typically start off by describing how we're all unique and different. And the reason some of these, let's call it in context, suboptimal, depending on what we're talking about, uh, suboptimal gene uh, combinations uh, continue to exist and proliferate in our, in, in, in our population at large is because of the wonderful world of evolutionary biology. And in fact, I always kind of take a, uh, a step back and, and, and help people understand that, again, in context of glutathionization or having null variants, uh, particularly in GSTM1 and GSTT1, which again, can be completely deleted or non-functional, it, this likely played a role in human evolution because of this balancing act between detoxification efficiency and again, this environmental exposure. So here are a few reasons, you know, uh, essentially that I think we can keep in mind, in my opinion, as to why these variants might have been, you know, pretty significant in our evolutionary ancestry. Um, and that is, you know, basically adaptation to diverse environments. They had to happen. Um, so uh, humans migrated from all over the place and adapted to all kinds of different environments of which contained all kinds of different levels of naturally occurring toxins like in plants and in foods and local water supplies. So having variations in your glutathionization, so GST by example, uh, included these null variants, basically may have allowed for certain populations to adapt better to these environmental differences and challenges. That's that's one. I think the other is um, balancing detox with other survival needs. So GST enzymes, so again, glutathione, which is the body's master antioxidant, and we all produce it. Um, it's a particularly important to neutralize, um, and make water soluble, uh, you know, in, in the metabolism of our day-to-day, -day. we're not just talking about industrial toxins or plumes of smoke from industry or dioxins and furans in the water or heavy metals. We're talking about our own metabolism, creating toxins that can dampen, uh, immune function, um, all of these things. So in some cases, Reducing the activity of GST enzymes uh, through these null variants may have actually conserved glutathione for other critical functions, like protecting against you know oxidative stress if there was a burden in the environment. So it gets a little bit uh, nuanced, a little bit um, uh, you know um, complex. But then the other one we just talked about, and it's really important here, and that is potentially lowering the risk of autoimmunity. So interestingly. Uh, studies actually studies show that uh, GST null variants may have a lower risk of certain autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. and even even uh, cancer, by the way, in, in some respect, depending on what we're seeing. Uh, and this this the slightly reduced 
not across the board, but this slightly and significantly reduced detoxification capability um, in people with null variants may actually lead to different immune responses as it relates to the uh, desire in confused immune. That's what it is. An autoimmunity is a confused immune system. Uh, it's the, you know, the, the, the system's desire to attack its own tissue. Uh, so, so, so for example, you, you get 2023 uh, flu. Okay. Um, you'll never get 2023 flu again. 2023 flu will, it, it will mutate and there'll be variations of that into the 2024 flu. Uh, and you can get exposed to that and have new symptoms reborn, but you'll never have the 2023 variant, although it continues to circulate. If you did, and you didn't remember, and that's the adaptive immune system, all you would ever be is sick and you would die very early, right? And so that concept has to be understood first to then understand how in some instances, when the body makes a mistake and attacks its own tissue, it doesn't ever stop. We can dampen it. We can definitely modulate autoimmunity. Um, that is the body's desire to attack its own tissue, but you can never make it uh, forget. If it forgot, then um, it would also forget 2023 flu or 2022 flu or any other flu or cold you've ever had. And you would quickly die from infection. Um, and so, you know, and last me, I think there's a bunch of other theories, but uh, dietary and environmental interactions. So evolutionarily, this is 30, 40, 50,000 years ago and beyond populations that consume diets low in toxins or, you know, lived in environments with fewer environmental pollutants may not have needed uh, efficient detox systems. <laughs> so it just it didn't exist, right? In these cases, the null variants basically had this neutral or even maybe favored for all of those other reasons I just mentioned um, existence. So I know that's long-winded. There's other reasons, but that's how I approach it. No good or bad. You just got what mom and dad dealt you. And if you got suboptimal, uh, then we're definitely going to you know give you ways in which you can uh, optimize and or enhance um, detoxification pathways. And, you know, just to uh, give a brief little bottom line that, you know, I, I do let my clients know just because they may have null variants doesn't mean um, that they don't make glutathione. Really, it just means that that individual has a reduced capacity for the detoxification of certain toxins or reactive intermediates. Um, yep you know, and it can cause buildup. So, I mean, it's, it's a much more complex system, but, um, we definitely don't want you guys thinking, you know, uh, in, in this larger well realm, like I can't detox Yes, you can. And there are ways to support it. Like Dr. Bryce said. So, uh, a few other, uh, genes, I mean, you know, like I had mentioned the detoxification pathways, um, the, uh, vitamin D. I do want to mention for vitamin D, uh, make sure to check your reports. If you haven't done your reports, hey, you can always get it done. Um, our team can actually drop in the chat uh, links on how you can look into getting your own DNA 360 reports done. Um, but you do want to double check to see of the three genes of this pathway, can you convert vitamin D2 to D3? A lot of people don't do that very well. Not the end of the world. You still need to get out in the sun. You still need to have that exposure. But this is where the supplementation, like what Dr. Bryce was talking about, if you live you know, above that you know, 40 degree latitude on the planet, you're gonna need it. Um, I happen to live above too. So uh, you wanna look at that. You know, you can take some D3 supplementation, K, don't forget the K2. We want to make sure that that calcium stays in the bones. Um, but also looking at how do you transport, you know, that GC gene? Um, how do you bind to your vitamin D receptor gene? Take a look at that because there are ways to, to support that. The way you are taking your vitamin D um, supplementation is important. If you're not very good at transport or, you know, binding, then you may want to separate your vitamin D dosing, you know, to a couple times a day, instead of taking it just all at once. Um, yeah, I think that VDR gene is probably one of the best studied when we, we look at all of them, as you described, but this is essential for, uh, immune function, but again, untoward modulation. So it plays a key role in not just upregulating, but also downregulating pro the, the communication. So if you know 
if your general sends the troops out to war because there seems to be on the you know there's a there's a, a foreign invader or someone's come up uh, the beach you know into your territory you send your troops out um you know they they, they got to fight the good fight and then like you were describing earlier come back and describe to the general in command do we need to send more have we won the battle how do we remember these uh these invading uh you know uh militants and 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 vitamin d is that communicate huge part of that communication process um as to send more retreat bring back um and and variants in the vitamin d receptor the vdr gene influences basically how, how well the body use utilizes vitamin d and receives it which is for innate and adaptive so I can't, you know, we obviously, there's just so much literature around vitamin D and immunity. Um, we can go on and on. And, um, so, but let's, but let's get into some of the other nuanced uh, stuff, you know, like uh, oxidative stress. And we, we're looking at, you know, superoxide dismutase, SOD2, and its relationship to both detoxification and, uh, and even, uh, you know, the interrelationship for virtually None of the genes that we look at, um, you know, don't, let me rephrase, all of the genes we look at has something, something or another thing to do with immune function. It's the big picture. There isn't an immune gene. Um, it's all of these genes and how they behave together. But what, what's superoxide dismutase doing for us? Uh, superoxide dismutase is what is actually taking the oxidants that get built up in the cell, the mitochondria. And it helps to break that down into uh, hydrogen peroxide. So it's part of the process of that breakdown of these reactive oxygen species, these you know compounds that can actually degrade and age the cell. And then it moves it over to G. PX, glutathione peroxidase, that's that gene. So it's those two genes for the antioxidation pathway. And the GPX actually takes the hydrogen peroxide, further breaks it down into the oxygen and water and moves it, hands it over to glutathione for the, the, the rest of the removal, you know, out of the cell, getting it out of the system, um, you know, because this is like a, a precursor to actually kind of straddles the phase one to phase two detoxification pathways where glutathione conjugation, methylation, glucuronidation, these are phase two detoxification pathways that happen. Um, and these are also very important. I noticed uh, a comment question um, asking about, uh, you know, as far as supplements, medications, things like that. Like, you know, okay, so we we get sick and okay, we wanna take supplements. We wanna take, you know, the medications that our doctor prescribes. How do we know by our genes if these are going to work for us? Yeah. These are the genes that we are going to be looking at. And actually we have our PGX test that does just that it's the pharmacogenetics testing where we actually look at your genes in relation to the pharmacopedia the the prescriptive medications it it's not set up for supplements per se you know that's something else but for prescribed medications you can see based on your genes how well do you metabolize these medications. Do you metabolize them fast? Do you not metabolize them at all? And several of these genes will then dictate how well your body can respond or not respond to the plethora of, you know, of drugs that are out there. So that's something, you know, really good to use that's available. Including uh, by the way, uh, immunologics, right? There's a lot of uh, biologics out there that control uh, a lot of the cytokines we were, in, in, you know, intimating uh, earlier on the it, the communication pathway in this uh, army analogy, whether it's two way radio or cell technology, <clears throat> pro inflammatory, anti inflammatory, right? driving down some of these pro inflammatory, uh, you know, uh, cytokines, which the general basically uses to dictate uh, information back to the front lines. So these biologics, which ones are best for you? The PGX testing can can help uh, inform that. 
Um, and by the way, on that same analogy, again, always coming back to this, the, 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 the sod too, the way I, I, I like to describe this to uh, anyone who's interested in, in the immune analogy is it's, this is the armor. Uh, or the shield that protects the uh, immune soldiers from oxidative damage caused by their own, um, you know, uh, firing of uh, weaponry. Uh, so by neutralizing these free radicals, SAW2 ensures basically that immune cells stay healthy and effective in battle, um, reducing collateral damage. That's what I like to describe it as essentially. So without, you know, it's an enzyme and manganese driven. So uh, we often will uh, use manganese in uh, our repertoire of tools to help enhance somebody who might not have a favorable SOD2 activity genetically, but the immune army uh, would be more vulnerable to this internal damage, uh, making it less effective if SOD2 is not necessarily favorable. Um, the super I'm actually going to grab onto your mention of manganese. So here we're talking about micronutrients, which actually works into another question um, that was brought up about, you know, what roles do specific nutrients play in enhancing genetic factors that contribute to the immune function? Well, there you go. You know, they are a cofactor into making these processes, these pathways work. And, you know, this is why we, you know, talk about the vitamin D, you know, that is a micronutrient well, hormone, and we've already gone there. But if you are looking at your diet and nutrition report, look at that. How well do you process the food, the information, the nutrients, the basic uh, tools that you're guards that your troops have you know what kind of tools do they have like what dr bryce was talking about in the beginning and you know how well do you deliver these tools to them so that part of your report is very very important um oh, yeah. You know, talking about let's focus on micronutrients. Here. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, look, I mean, there's a laundry list, right? I mean, I think you know, it. it, it but that would it, take us hours about, and hours. Yeah, I mean, but 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 we can oh, we can get quickly this for that. Why not? That's a great question, and um, a lot of the letter vitamins that we look at. Um, and, and, and minerals, uh, how about this for that? So whether it's, um, you know, zinc, right? Let's start zinc. Zinc's so important. We talk about zinc and, and, you know, the, the use of zinc systemically, um, it's critical for immune function, antiviral defense. So genetic variations in the SLC zero or three, zero, eight, 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 eight. eight. <laughs> uh, always for that acronym is always hard to remember. Um, th this increases the, the need for zinc on, on a bunch of different levels. Um, you know, vitamin C, um, SLC 23A1, uh, that might require that you need more vitamin C, don't have enough circulating. It's obviously that's essential for immune cell, uh, function and reducing inflammation, um, uh, glutathione. Oh, I was going to say BCMO1 gene. That's your beta carotene monooxygenase for vitamin A. Vitamin A is a fantastic antioxidant. I think that's the vitamin D of the future. I mean, vitamin D will always be important, but I think it's vitamin A in its retinal proformed vitamin A, because that's the whole point about that variation, right? You can't convert beta carotene, which is found in the varietal, you know, yellow and orange vegetables. You can't convert it into retinol uh, proformed vitamin A. So if you're low in that, there is immune system dysregulation across the board, right? And we yeah. talked about it um, in context of, well, maybe we didn't, but superoxide dismutase, glutathionization, selenium. If you've got poor variations around there, N-acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid, selenium, these are the ingredients to the recipe of making uh, more glutathione. So, you know, the list is quite long, actually. Um, there's a lot of, you know, methylation is another example. Methylation is almost synonymous with uh, immune system dysregulation and, and inflammation, if we, you know, want to be really super top line about it. And of course, the whole B complex, B2, B6, but particularly folate, folic acid, and B12 are key to that cycle happening uh, for the cell to drive um, downstream, anyways, immune uh, regulation. And so, people can find out what forms of folate B9 or right. B12 that they need genetically speaking. So, you know, the, the gene that we look at in the methylation pathway that can determine that is your SHMT1 gene. That's for folate. For cobalamin, it's the MTR gene, whether you can handle a methylated form or whether you need an adenosylated form. So again, you want to make sure that you are supplementing 
for your genes, that right. you are actually taking in something that's going to work for you. And by the way, the, these nutrients, you know, are, are uh, this for that very specifically, you know, here's the genetic variation. We know what to slot in, but <clears throat> combined with targeted supplements, like curcumin, turmeric extract, for example, for inflammation control, because we can deduce that. And, you know, for example, beta glucan for enhanced immune cell activity. This allows us to be able to uh, create really personalized regimens, supplement regimens based on your genetic makeup. That's the whole point. Very precision based approach to supplementation. Um, and that ensures your immune system isn't only supported, but tailored for reactivity. Um, you know, it's, it's this resilience factor, right? There's no miracle to this. It's just getting those ingredients to up or down regulate your immune function, wherever it might be over or underperforming. We call it black label, uh, and black label is a custom formula that's personalized, um, based on your age and stage, gender, height, weight, metabolism, and genetics. It's informed by genes. So it's a super simple, you're working with one of our clinicians or, you know, based on a very short questionnaire that you complete, it'll assess what ingredients, again, the slot ins, right? The letter vitamins and minerals and, or some of these ingredients that are really powerful evidence-based, you know, you know, we've got to have the science there, obviously, uh, efficacy, transparency, traceability, purity, potency. We follow a very stringent onboarding system for these ingredients we choose to use, but assesses which ingredients benefit you. Then we custom compound it at the right doses. And, um, you know, that's, that's the black label concept essentially, uh, that we have just launched at the uh, DNA company recently. So, um, excited about that. So let's dive a bit more into the questions, uh, cause yeah. we've got great ones here. Um, so, oh, I don't, so I, I apologize if I mispronounce, um, Sandhya, Sandhya. Sandhya. Okay. Uh, has a question. Have a, uh, they have a family member with lower IgA immune cells and is prone to infections. How can these numbers be improved? Do you have, or have you worked with any clients in this situation or are you familiar? Yeah. Um, you know, immunoglobulin, A, G, E, they all kind of stand for different, uh, let's call it timing for simplicity's sake, when your immune system may have uh, responded uh, at a given time. And again, memory cell formation, anti antigen antibody formation. By the way, this is a great place to be able to describe to folks that, you know, most of us walk around with you know, having had memory, of course, of, of some, everything from childhood diseases to, um, you know, infections that stick around with us, but don't necessarily express. So for example, what I mean is, you know, we've all, most of us anyway, the large majority of us have had exposure to mono, kissing disease, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, many of us, uh, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex family of viruses, you know, not just cold sores or herpes simplex too, but also, uh, HSV six, right? Um, a lot of us obviously recently experienced COVID, um, various flu virus. So some of these viruses transient, they come and go, we develop immune system responses. And as I explained earlier, we're not going to get those again, or if we do, it's a mutated form and we have to relearn. Uh, but cytomegalovirus, um, you know, Epstein-Barr virus, mono, and all these different things, they hide out in the back, uh, dorsal root ganglia, it's called, called of our, our spinal cord, and they come out and play um, you re-express these and succumb to some of these longer, you know, term illnesses when your immune system is defunct or you have susceptibilities through genetics and, or you're driving your immune system down through lack of sleep, poor diet, poor exercise, et cetera, et cetera. They come out They're They're otherwise walled off. Tuberculosis is a great way of looking at this TB tuberculosis, you know, bone or, or lung formation, the body. Again, a lot of us walk around with this and never become symptomatic because the immune system puts it in jail walls it off. It'll never get a chance to come out and play unless your immune system is, is, is experiencing a state of uh, dysregulation or deficiency. Anyway, so low immunoglobulin A, it's important in the immune system, especially mucosal immunity. So respiratory, digestive, uh, urinary tracts, people with urinary tract infections often have a, you know, generally low Ig activity. Um, but, but the number one thing, and you talked about it earlier is uh, probiotics, you know, uh, lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidobacterium, uh, these strains have been proven to upregulate IgA production, promote gut health. Um, which by the way, is a major site of IGA production. This is why we talk about the immune system being, you know, 80 to so percent of it in our gut. 
um, and and also pre-box. And then I and I and I and I, and I want to say we talked about three of them just now. They inform IGA production indirectly, and that is your zinc solute carrier or the uh, the solute uh, the SLC gene for zinc, vitamin A, the BCMO one gene, and vitamin D. Zinc is essential for immune function, but also uh, for immune cell production and IgA. Vitamin A, same thing, vitamin D. I also think people have to learn how to reduce stress. We talked about these other things, improved mm -hmm. sleep. These will all reduce immunoglobulins, which are important, again, in this manufacturing of, um, of immune cell regulation and memory cell formation. Yeah, and things like zinc, like you said, it very important uh, for immune function, for health. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you know that or have done this or heard this, that when you have like an active infection or getting you know sick, what do you do? Oh, you take zinc lozenges, you, you boost up your zinc. Well, how that actually works is that zinc will uh, inhibit the, uh, the virus's ability to proliferate to end up regrowing. The only thing is that it, it will do that in the bloodstream for, you know, viruses and stuff that haven't gotten into the cell yet, but in the cell, it, it can't get in the cell all by itself. So it needs what you call a zinc ionophore. Um, it's kind of like the zinc is the bullet, but it needs a gun to shoot it into the cell. So, uh, you know, these are things NAC does that. Um, you know, that would be a supplement that does that. Um, you know, there are other prescriptions that also allow that, but we need to get that in. So, you know, NAC and acetylcysteine, that is a precursor for glutathione. So, you know, having foods that provide this or, or taking supplements that help to provide this, you know, is always uh, good because they work together. They work as a team. It's usually never just one thing, either of cause not necessarily, but of cause or of um, remedy. So, you know, looking at that, but again, I do want to reiterate any of these supplements and, you know, protocols or things that we have worked with, you know, with clients that we are talking about is for educational purposes only. We are not telling you to go out and buy these, to do these, to take these right away. Um, you really need to double check with your healthcare provider. Um, so just... <laughs> that and i'm and i'm smiling here as you're talking about this because i i find myself and it's this time of year by the way and i'm almost and i'm out i don't know if you can see this bottle or if we, we've talked about you and i specifically see like how there's like almost oh yeah <laughs> so so this i mean we've heard of echinacea yep. and uh echinacea is by and large you know been misunderstood or mis you know i guess you know character typed as an immune stimulant but it really is more of this immune modulator anyways I got to say, people have to learn about evidence-based botanicals as well. We use a lot of them at, at uh, the DNA company, but I just got to talk about the science really quickly because we don't formulate with this, but I just got to call this stuff out because this, this is something I just realized I do at this time of year myself, um, echinacea. And as you know, Dr. Varden, but I mean, just sharing this with folks uh, that maybe don't know, one of the hats I wear for the DNA company um, as chief of innovations is to travel the world and do due diligence on these ingredients um, and which ones are evidence-based. So I've been all across the planet, like China, uh, you know, India, Asia, across uh, Malaysia, Japan. I've been through um, Europe. This story is in Switzerland. There's unparalleled antiviral uh, protection through certain types of echinacea. So um, here's the story. Amazing, obviously, for cold and flu season, especially with RSVs and influenza, but even COVID-19 clinically proven, 35 human clinical trials plus, by the way. So antiviral activity, anti-inflammatory activity, antibacterial activity, and it fights sars cov um, Echinacea is powerful. Uh, I just got to, I, I just got to throw it out there. Um, this one, by the way, as I was just showing people is, um, is, uh, Echinoforce. That's the spray that I was just using. So one of those things I think people should learn about and, um, studies are impressive reducing, by the way, risk. This is where the studies are reducing risk by 65% and antibiotic use by 76%. Anytime we can do that, support the microbiome. I think we're doing well. Anyways, 
just realized that I was out of it and I got to get more. <laughs> actually, silver is another good one. Um, yeah, colloidal silver. Well, actually, even oh. better, chelated silver. Uh, Third Rock Essentials actually has a patent on that, and it is actually more bioavailable because it is chelated with citric acid, which your body craves. That's, you know, part of, you know, the Krebs cycle and, and energy. So that works very well. That silver actually helps remove the substrate, um, you know, like the food and the, the ability for these bacteria and other things to grow. So it, it stops that. I mean, I personally use it. Um, I use uh, the spray bottle, you know, you, and the nice thing is that it's all non-toxic food grade products. Um, you know, when I travel, spritz them in my mouth, even, you know, breathe it in my nose. I'll, you know, actually it's been found to work well for conjunctivitis. So you can right. actually buy it and it's yes. safe. Um, yeah. And these are the, these are the first line therapies, right? I mean, if you, you know, you're experience we all know the feeling like we just know we can tell all oh, i'm coming down with something uh got to start doing those things if you know genetically informed by genetics that it's the zinc gene that you know you've got some challenges with hey <laughs> probably even better than echinacea or 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 or, or um, uh, silver combined is a zinc spray uh would just make sense if that's you mm -hmm. um and so, and then, so let's answer some more questions. So Dirk is asking, uh, what constitutes the immune system? Uh, and where is the immune system located? Oh, okay. We didn't cover that. Uh, it show it shows up everywhere, but there's some central place. Okay. Uh, like armies of B and T cells. Yeah. So, uh, B cells, well, do you want to take this or do you want me to answer oh, this? No, go ahead and I, I'll, I'll pipe in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. B cells are called B cells because they're made in the bone marrow. T cells are T cells because they're thymus cells. And, uh, you know, they, they, you know, but your immune system travels around the body through the blood, the white blood cells. That's when you get a CBC or complete blood count with your family doctor looking at red blood cell count, white blood cell count, then they fraction these things. Um, and, you know, white blood cells, we made of basophils and eosinophils and macrophages and all these different things. Um, but they, they reside uh, through the bloodstream, they're distributed through the lymphatic system, they originate in the bone marrow and or um, as granulocytes and early un immature cells, then they form into these other cells. Uh, and uh, the thymus, for example, will make the immature, <laughs> immature. But they, they got to grow up. They got to learn, right? They got to learn. And that's the whole process. So yeah, nooks and crannies, the galt. And again, back to the gut and why we keep talking about how 80% of your immune system is in the gut. That acronym, G-A-L-T, gut associated lymphoid tissue is all of this lymph, which is the 80% that's enraveled within uh, the fascia that holds your guts together and all this lymph. And the reason it's there is because think of this tube, it's the highest exposure than anywhere else in the body, muc mucus uh, um, exposure or uh, mucus tissue exposure to your outside environment. There's so much bacteria that you ingest so many things, helminths and parasites and so forth that travel through. So these cells, your immune cells have to be heavily active in that region. And they're largely controlled and managed or modulated, balanced, if you will, by the microbiome, the good bacteria that reside there. So yeah, uh, and the immune system travels everywhere. It can get into the nooks and crannies of your joint tissue. It can travel. You don't want it to necessarily get every single place in your body because that sometimes that can instigate uh, this sort of uh, autoimmune challenge some people are faced with, or at least not get there too heavily. Uh, but it does otherwise uh, sit in, you know, uh, various glands, uh, lymph and uh, the blood system. Yeah, and, and honestly, the, the lymphatic system is so very important and it really goes everywhere. Um, it is what is clearing and collecting the junk um, in the extracellular matrix. That's the area outside of the cells, um, you know, and the, the different um, organs that are important for the lymphatics, uh, as Dr. Wild has already mentioned a few, you know, your lymph nodes, um, the spleen, you know, th these these different organs. That's why when you get sick, you know, especially with, you know, maybe something in the throat, your, your lymph nodes here, you know, will start swelling. That's because what's end up happening is those B cells, those, you know, memory cells, they are starting to accumulate, to fight off and, and start proliferating, start making, you know, getting more of the troops, you know, ready to fight. So 
this this is part of what happens and we have to make sure your lymphatics are flowing and draining very important because that's also like i had said very important for taking out the trash we need to have that to remove toxins um so you know we want to get get rid of the trash make sure that not as much is coming in that's that mitigation yeah uh, so. You know, uh, and I, and I, and I, and I love this question from Nina, who's asking, I don't think I could defeat metastatic breast cancer with immunity. I think she means immunity alone. And it's interesting because we all experience cancer. Uh, we all have cancer floating around our systems uh, in small amounts, but our immune systems know what to do with it by and large. It's when they go uh, significantly rogue and or immune systems are deficient or imbalanced that cancer can take a hold. Anyways, she's talking about hyperthermia three times, um, I suppose, a week to increase the temperature. Maybe she just meant uh, she did it three times uh, to increase the temperature. Hyper meaning, you know, elevated or hot uh, to destroy the cancer. It's like almost like a fake fever. And all three three times she fell into a coma after therapy, but she was cured. Yeah, that's like the, so she means three times in general. Um, so um, I, I, I was going to pull in our CEO, but I've just learned, I think she's indisposed. But what I love about our forward thinking CEO is that she's always innovating and in our line extension of testing because, you know, DNA is one and done, but then how do we actually track some of these things? So one of the tests she's brought on uh, that we talk about a lot is liquid B, liquid biopsy. And so what this is, is non-diagnostic, but it looks at blood for um, a plethora of various risks uh, on towards certain cancers, solid tumors and other types of cancers. So I, I highly recommend, you know, anyone who's interested in, you know, looking at risk for uh, cancer uh, gets the liquid biopsy done. But but soon enough uh, for this crowd uh, here tonight to learn, we're coming out with a breast cancer 360. So in lieu of that question, I thought I'd bring this up and um, follow my Instagram channel, Wild on Health, uh, where I talk all about the DNA company proc products and services on a frequent basis. I'll let everyone here know, and please spread the word. When we launch this breast cancer, we have a special doctor guest who's going to describe and help you understand what this is all about. But our BC, our breast cancer 360, uh, we're about to launch that in the coming weeks. And um, we're going to make some pretty cool exclusive offers around that. And of course, the action plan is to what you do around it. But I love that concept of hyperthermia. Have you, have you, do you know much about it, uh, Dr. Varden? Do you know much about the inducement of extremely high? This is medically supervised, obviously. But when we have a fever, interferon, of course, being one of those cytokines that are so powerful of calling in the troops, natural killer cells and uh, some of our SEAL army to, to attack um, you know, cancer. So, um, yeah, that... I, I'm familiar with the theory and how the mechanisms work, uh, at a cellular level, because I actually did a lot of research in cellular biology, molecular genetics in grad school. Um, but I have, I don't have any experience on, on the clinical side of that or, you know, anything, but, um, yeah, it's very interesting. And I do have to say how wonderful, that you were cured. That's really yes. fine. So kudos to you for, for going, you know, through such a tremendous experience and, and sharing, you know, some of these novel technologies. I mean, uh, you know, hormesis, right? The stressors that are not too much to kill you, but uh, of which maybe, you know, getting into a sauna is not going to be enough to do anything big. You know, it, it begs questions and people start to ask other good questions. So thank you for sharing that. You know, which uh, made me think of a gene that we look at um, that deals with thermoregulation and that's the UCP1 gene. Yeah. So you can actually, you know, take a look at your genes and see how well do you have regulated or dysregulated thermoregulation, um, you know, because that can also play a factor into treatments or just in general, like if, you know, you want to try a uh, cold plunge, you know, or, or doing different things, how well will this work for you? Not saying that it couldn't work at all. Um, but again, this is something that you should discuss with your doctor, your healthcare practitioner. Um, you know, and, and when you're talking about the UCP, I'm thinking about other uh, genes, because again, so many that we look at are related, but I'm remiss 
if I don't say uh, briefly the HLA, because we look at this in context mainly around, you know, um, it's a human leukocyte antibody gene uh, and a bunch of them, but in context of whether or not <clears throat> uh, an individual might be uh, non-celiac and even or potentially celiac uh, responsive to gluten, but um, the general human leukocyte antibody genes are vital. Uh, to immune system function because they help bot the um, our systems recognize and respond to viruses and bacteria as well. So it's it's how um, uh, basically how uh, you know efficiently the immune system can detect the pathogens um, or trigger these appropriate responses. So um, autoimmunity is involved. That's the regulatory component to gluten, which by the way I see an epidemic in gluten sensitive individuals with these positive HLA genes that if they don't do what they should do, which is just avoidance, we talked about that at the top. Some of this is just avoidance. They don't do avoidance of gluten, barley, rye, spell, wheat, uh, pasta cakes, cookies. Uh, what will happen is they'll often trigger response to their thyroid. And uh, you can all look this up. The thyroid tissue is molecularly almost identical to the gluten molecule. So go figure, it's a perfect example of how the immune system works. If it sees, in the case of a virus and you're fighting a flu and there's a lot of immune army out there and you've got a bit of a permeability in your gut and gluten gets through, so it translocates from your gut into your general circulation, then your immune system says under attack against viruses, it's ramped up, says, Hey, wait a second. What's that stuff over there? That, that, that looks foreign. Let's attack it just in case. So it does, um, HLA genes inform that it should, uh, some of us more predisposed to others. And then, you know, as you start to recover and inflammation and starts to dampen and you get over this cold or flu and the sitting immune system is doing what it does to circulate the body. And then it goes, Hey, wait a second, that thyroid tissue there, I thought that was our own organ, but could it also maybe be gluten? I'm confused. I don't know. Let's be safe and let's attack in case. And so it starts to develop antibodies to your own thyroid tissue. And that's a confused state. It made a mistake, but it made a mistake hedging its bets. So it starts to attack. That's autoimmune thyroiditis, Hashimoto's graves. I see a ton of that stuff. Leaky gut, translocating gluten across the membrane into general circulation, causing an, an, an immune system that's uh, confused. And then, you know, down the road. And so HLA genes inform a lot, not just gluten, uh, but in relation to gluten, uh, this, you know, the, the HLA, the DQ2 and the DQ8, they're strongly associated with the celiac disease. Um, and um, anyway, people with these HLA gene variants are, are more likely to develop gluten sensitivity and they should know about it. So- uh, yeah, and and I do want to throw in, even though we're not going to dive into it tonight, is leaky gut. More likely, you have leaky brain as well. Right. So there's going to be issues around there, and we actually uh, did a webinar about that. So, uh, next question: Craig asks, "Does the COMT gene break down catecholamines?" And okay, so for all of you, COMT that's the C O M T, and yes. Um, actually, COMT stands for catechol-O-methyltransferase, and this plays a critical role in the breakdown of catecholamines. And this includes really important neurotransmitters like dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, um, and really this is also uh, the like the last player, that end piece on that methylation process. Um, it's what puts that methyl group onto that substrate to help with that breakdown. So answer, yes. <laughs> you got it. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? <clears throat> what is pre-activated vitamin D3? Why? Uh, that's what my report tells me. Uh, I don't, do you want to take that one? That's what my report. So, I mean, there's D2 and then there's D3 colocalciferol. Um, there is, uh, do you want, I don't really get the question. I'm sorry. That's what my report tells me. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there is the process of D2, like we talked about that, uh, your CYP2R1, right. CYP2R1 gene 
converts into D3. Um, and then it's that storage form that is the 25 hydroxy vitamin D that's often tested uh, through blood work where we can actually see your levels. That's actually a storage form. And that's, it's converted in the liver. Then it goes over to the kidney and gets converted to the bioactive form that's actually, you know, used. But those values that uh, that number can change very dramatically, you know, within a very, very short period of time. That's why it's, it can be tested. Yes, it does. It, it is tested, but that's not the, uh, the typical vitamin D level test that is done. Um, it's usually that 24 or 25 OHD uh, test because that is that stays more relatively stable, you know, like over a three month period. So, or the one twenty five. It's nice to have both of them sometimes. If you oh can't yeah, crack oh the code. absolutely, it can be very. But generally, you know, for most people, the you know, if they talk to their doctors, hey, I'd like a vitamin D test. It's the twenty five O eight. So, um, unless the doctor is really very aware and knows how to utilize the information of the one twenty five. Uh, which is that bioactive form. Yeah. So. Okay, very good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, Craig is asking, how does Lyme and autoimmune symptoms differ? And should I be doing something to focus on my detox system, even when my system is showing normal? Loaded question. Well, first of all, Lyme is um, a spirochete bacteria. Um which is otherwise known as Borrelia or Bor Borrelia, rather Berg de Ferry. And uh, it's typically or largely known to be transmitted through ticks. New and interesting research around how this might actually be a sexually transmitted disease now, and I'll confirm about that. But <clears throat> this, is this is, by the way, another one of those scenarios where so many of us, specifically in the Northeastern seaboard where ticks run, you know, a rampant, um, we've had exposure, but not all of us had develop or develop symptoms. Um, this is a hard disease to diagnose. I know because my clinic, uh, not myself, but my colleagues in my clinic, some of them focus on this as a uh, special interest. So I see a lot come through and, uh, whether it's Epstein-Barr virus that causes mono that then if you don't get over it and it becomes chronic causes fibromyalgia or it's COVID that might cause long COVID or it's uh, herpes simplex that might cause neurological dysfunction or it's Lyme that might cause chronic, you know, Lyme, um, not everyone who's got the, in fact, in fact, the, by and large, the majority of people who become infected do a good job of managing that infection at the acute level and don't become chronically infected. They wall it off. That's what I was describing earlier. So, but autoimmune conditions, this is caused by immune system, again, making a mistake, attacking the body's own tissues. And this can happen, you know, in all kinds of different situations, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, SLS, uh, systemic um, lupus, multiple sclerosis, the list is quite long, but the exact cause is not necessarily known, sometimes triggered by viruses or acute infections, but they involve genetics. They're informed by genetics and environmental triggers, et cetera. <clears throat> Lyme, if we have had the infection, typically a healthy person walls it off. It stays you know, in nooks and crannies in the body, it doesn't get to come out and play. Uh, it's when uh, the immune system is slightly uh, dysfunctional that it does, and you can develop chronic Lyme disease. So um, detox anyways, to wrap that question up is, it is, it, you know, it is so important. And, and back to your concept around the null variant and how people should learn that they'll, they still detoxify. Here's what we find in my clinical practice anyways, and it's in the literature as well. <clears throat> People with dual null variants, so that is GSTT1 null, GSTM1 null, typically AG or GG presentation with their GSTP1, um, superoxide dismutase challenges, methylation defect, that's the picture that people have genetically that predispose them to long COVID, fibromyalgia, chronic repeated her herpetic uh, you know, and, and neurological disorders, and Lyme. I'm sorry to say, but that is the genetic predisposition. Doesn't mean you're going to have it. It doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. It just means that's the typical picture clinically that predisposes. So yes, you, what was the actual way he asked the question? Something like, should he pay attention, Craig, to his detox pathways? It's probably literally the most important thing to pay attention to when mm -hmm. you're thinking about autoimmune and Lyme. That's my response. 
Uh, there's uh, some questions that are probably a little bit um, longer to answer, but I, I want to get through some of the quick ones. Um, Sanjia uh, had another question uh, asking, does the PGX test predict according to the age of the subject? Uh, the answer is no. Um, it, it's not about age. It's just about your genetics because your genetics don't, doesn't change from the time you're born to the time you die. So it's really looking at your blueprint, you know, how does it generally function if it's dysregulated uh, in the way of uh, how well it may metabolize. Um, and it does not take into account the epigenetic factors. Um, it is strictly based on your genetic blueprint. Um, now, the only thing that would necessarily change in a PGX report is addition of new medications as times go as time goes on, because our knowledge of pharmacogenetics of, of the pharmacopedia is constantly, you know, uh, being added to and an changing, seeing look how many medications come out. I mean, there's just, I mean, you should see the physician's desk reference. It looks like a Bible. Um, so, you know, over time, the knowledge and research can change, but your genetics don't. So that's standard. Um, so that answers that question real quick. Um, there was another, uh, Malcolm had a question about, uh, is chronically high GGT, suggestive of poor detoxification. Now, for those of you out there, GGT stands for gamma glutamyl transferase. Um, now, to uh, answer the question, because this person says they don't drink alcohol, but the GGT typically runs, you know, in a range of 60 to 80. Um, and, okay, so when you are looking at that type of range, yes, that can be subject, uh, suggestive of potential detoxification issues or some other underlying conditions, uh, even in the absence of alcohol consumption. Um, you know, well, GGT is often used as a marker of alcohol consumption. Elevated levels can indicate other factors affecting liver function and detoxification pathways. So, um, you know, this is really something that you... environmental yes. issues, oxidative stress, um, you know, toxins and, you know, uh, but, but, you know, this NAFLD, NAFLD is, is my guess here. And you have to have AST, ALT, um, you know, ALP, all of these others to really form a proper you know, GGT is super sensitive, right? But, um, it, you know, you know, if there's an ultrasound in your future, what did it say? Typically runs in the 60 to 80. Yeah. I, I would suspect, you know, just, you can't diagnose based on one thing, but I would, I would highly suspect that, um, you know, an ultrasound abdominal ultrasound would reveal fatty striations and it's probably, you know, and then, and it's not answering what the underlying cause is. It's probably GST gene genetic predispositions to poor detox pathways plus and environmental a load lot of assumptions, you know, that yeah. we, based on just general knowledge. And again, this is just, you know, hypothetical thought, but really it is, you know, taking it back to the doctors that you're working with that know your history that have that, you know, as, as much information and pieces of the puzzle that you can put together to actually better see the full picture, the better. Yeah. Um, but I will, I will throw out though, uh, <clears throat> remaining sort of within my area of expertise in the ingredient sector, uh, tocotrienols, which we do use in our black label formulary. This is vitamin um, E for all of you out there. Yeah, there's eight isomers or types of vitamin E, four of which are tocopherols and four of which are tocotrienols. And actually, if you just go to tocotrienol, this is a non-commercial website, just about the ingredient itself, tocotrienols.org, you'll find information about how um, you know, at least three, maybe four human clinical trials. And this is the work of Dr. Chan Ed Sen of Ohio State University. And he was with his team reversing white matter lesions post-stroke uh, in people's brains, but also a side benefit found cardiovascular as well as liver, um, even hair loss, by the way, in men, funny, but there's all these indications for tocotrienols. <clears throat> it can help along with diet and lifestyle measures, reverse non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD. It's quite a remarkable ingredient with a lot of evidence to back it. 
we're so, coming up to the end here, but you, uh, I think we can blast out two answers. Uh, so Carol is asking, or well, first she states that her daughter had her DNA report. Um, she says she has a rare estrogen that causes inflammation. Now, I would suspect that would be, you know, uh, that she has an increased um, metabolism to probably one of the inflammatory metabolites, either the 4-hydroxy or 16-alpha-hydroxy esterones. So, you know, just kind of throwing that out there to put some context into it. Um, I, I mean, I don't personally know. I am just, you know, theorizing here. Um, and she says that, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that they do not have the results from the gut or mold test. Um, but her daughter is trying the carnivore diet, but her RA, a rheumatoid arthritis, flares up and has been brutal. Um, how can she modulate autoimmunity successfully since you, meaning uh, Dr. Wild, you had said that her RA will never go away. She has had RA since nine years old and is now 26. Um, I, I, I do want to mention here that um, again, we can talk about some theorization as uh, some clarity as educational, but since we don't know all of her background, we don't know all of her medical, we cannot give, um, you know, treatment protocols or saying, okay, do this. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. I do want to say, although I did say, and I'll substantiate RA or autoimmunity rheumatoid arthritis in this case won't <clears throat> ever go away. That is to say cure to the point where it's obsolete. That's irrelevant because you can get to a point where you're asymptomatic for the rest of your life. And so there's a lot of, again, Epstein-Barr virus. I have titers. I had mono when I was a kid. I didn't experience the sleep. We all had that friend in high school who disappeared for two months. They came back. Oh, I had mono. They had mono and they were extremely symptomatic more likely in the future to actually, in that case, experience fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. It's just correlated. But the point I'm trying to make is that while you've been diagnosed with this condition uh, and you're symptomatic and RA, rheumatoid factor, RF is up, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein is elevated. All these biomarkers are elevated. Um, and you would see on a, on a cytokine proliferation analysis, you'd see certain things like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, all these different things are elevated. You can modulate them, meaning you can get them into balance by understanding what your body is telling you through genetics and functional testing, which we offer. So modulating RA uh, and inflammation in general, especially in context of this like rare, I'm not sure we're talking about rare estrogen related genetic variant, but it, this requires personalized multi-pronged approach. Like you got to see one of our clinicians um, well, and, and the carnivore diet might help in eliminating potential. I see this all the time. It's a pretty strict diet. It's hard to do for the very long term, but it's immunomodulating. It's immunoregulating. Uh, somebody else, I think had a question on Crohn's and colitis. You know, there are people out there, you know, um, that, that are, uh, are celebrity status trying this carnivore diet in lieu of having Crohn's or colitis diagnoses and N of one anecdote reversing, or at least becoming asymptomatic. So anyway, focusing on hormone regulation, uh, you know, modulation, gut health, detoxification, immune regulation. I should just throw out there again, my area of expertise, uh, ingredients, BIM, methane, probiotics, omega-3s. These are all probably going to help the inflammation. But while you await the, uh, the, uh, gut and the mold tests and all these things work with a clinician to fine tune the approach that would ultimately work to balance bring down the pro-inflammatory, but as importantly, it's where a lot of clinicians miss, but we know what we're doing at the DNA company, bring up the anti-inflammatory side of the equation, immunomodulation, immune balance. That's the name of the game. Yeah. And it's also, you know, a way for you to maybe learn some other tools, techniques, um, things to try and do that you haven't thought of yet. We have very big toolboxes and we work together as a team. So um, lots of brains, lots of ideas. So uh, definitely I, I would also encourage you to work with one of our uh, practitioners. So our last question of the night uh, is Donna, considering all the suboptimal areas in her DNA 360 report, she mentioned zero copies of the GSTT1, poor optimization of vitamin A and zinc. Um, it's resulting in a compromised immune system. Is this how, why, 
Crohn's developed. So I'm suspecting she's been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Um, now on third biologic, which suppresses the immune system and now manifesting into skin issues. She was diagnosed in 2012. Um, there must be a root cause. There's always a root cause. Um, but when you start getting into complex situations and all of this other stuff, the important thing is to start clearing the muddy waters, start seeing and figuring out, cleaning up the things, uh, the low hanging fruit, the things that are easily, you know, implemented and deal with, you know, see if that works. Um, if there are still problems, then dig some more. Let's see what else is going on. Um, this really takes working with, uh, you know, a, a, a seasoned practitioner, someone yeah. who knows how to do this, who knows the right questions to ask, who knows what to look at, um, or at least, you know, where to start navigating and digging in. Um, so do you have any um, input on this? Um, I would say exactly what you're saying with the maybe caveat or, you know, uh, when we're talking about underlying cause, I always like to put on a plural to that. There's typically no needle in a haystack in these complex conditions um, that, you know, yes, you know, detoxification is going to be part of it. Um, managing, uh, you know, your microbiome is going to be another big part of it. Um, <clears throat> looking at your stress levels, it's a very stress induced waxing and waning you know, typically what we're looking at is what causes or contributes to the uh, chronicity <clears throat> by looking at the acute exacerbations of the chronic condition, meaning what are those things that are pushing you beyond your ability to cope? Once again, you can manage Crohn's to the point where you're asymptomatic, but will it always be your Achilles heel if you don't address underlying issues, plural, by supporting detox pathways with things like glutathione or optimizing vitamin A and zinc levels or microbiome levels. <clears throat> so you boil over, don't sleep well, don't eat well, have a lot of stress, Crohn's will come out and play. That's, I think, really what the name of the game. And, the, and, a, and a clinician is going to help uh, customize a protocol, lifestyle, diet, nutrition, et cetera, <clears throat> that will keep you under threat. We're supposed to be able to deal with stress, viruses, bacteria, toxins in the environment, et cetera. Some of us better than others in certain areas, but uh, it's when we surpass our human threshold, our ability to cope with all those variables that we end up with symptoms, warning signs, flags, and the body saying, give me this more of this, and I'm going to continue to degenerate and maybe even eventually expire prematurely. So getting under that boiling point, uh, that threshold. Um, so it's not always, you know, you know, ne necessarily trying to uh, cure something. It's just getting to the point where the body's able to manage, um, uh, to the point of your, you become asymptomatic. I think that's it. Uh, and, um, I don't know, should we wrap there? Yes, I think this is a, a perfect opportunity. And I do want to say thank you to everyone for joining us, uh, tonight. We, we are here because you want the knowledge, because you want to learn more. And we hope you did learn more uh, tonight and during this discussion. Um, please remember, keep an eye out for our new revolutionary test that's going to be launched mid-month. Uh, it will be available on Dr. Wild's Instagram and on our DNA company Instagram. So, you know, again, please keep your eyes out for that. And I want to say thank you, Dr. Wild. It is just it's such a tremendous pleasure working with you, uh, doing these webinars with you, uh, that big, beautiful brain of yours. <laughs> oh, right back at you. Are you kidding? This is an and, honor. Uh, it's it's absolutely fabulous. And, and we could just fun. keep talking for hours. There's just so much uh, to cover, but we, we are limited, you know, in time, but we do have two to three webinars a week. So, you know, please join us, keep learning, keep asking your questions. Please keep giving us input on things that you want to hear yep. about. We're here for you. Absolutely. For help you optimize your health. Yep. So. And I'll just end off, I'll sign off by saying, you know, remember your immune system is as unique as you are. And so aligning your approach with your genetics, informed by genetics, you're setting yourself up for a healthier, stronger, faster, better you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Barden, 
for your incredible person, brain and clinical prowess. Um, and thank everybody else here, of course, for joining us. And here's to unlocking the power of your personalized immune health. Until next time. Cheers.